Perhaps you thought the National Trust meant just a lot of grand houses with very nice lady volunteers in them. Well, there is a lot more to it than that, as I hope we'll show you. Snowdonia is one of the most beautiful parts of Wales. Much of it is owned and looked after by the National Trust. And one of the most important functions of the National Trust is to ensure, in ways we are quite often unaware of, that unspoiled landscapes like these remain unspoiled. I've been doing a bit of work for the Snowdonia Appeal, and I've discovered that the National Trust owns over half a million acres of land, including nearly a hundred nature reserves throughout Northern Ireland, England and Wales. Now, before I became involved in the um, National Trust and the Snowdonia Appeal, I had no idea at all of the vast amount of work involved, uh, the time, effort and money that goes into conserving our heritage. The National Trust was started in 1895, and one of its first major achievements was to protect the uniquely beautiful landscape of the Lake District from the clutches of the acquisitive Victorian developers. This is a very uh, historic place for the National Trust and a, and a very evocative one because this plaque commemorates the first acquisition by the Trust in the Lake District and it commemorates the planting of these oak trees by Princess Louise who was asked to do it on our behalf with our founders. Octavia Hill, Sir Robert Hunter and Canon Rawnsley. But it was a, a, an absolutely appalling day, not at all like this, with a tremendous driving rain and wind. And I, I understand that the marquee uh, blew away <laughs> during the middle of the ceremony. One wonders what the peaceful Derwent water would have looked like if its shores had not been protected. I would certainly have ex expected to see a great deal of development, on, probably on this and the other side of the lake, with marinas and uh, ho hotels probably out of scale with the landscape, and a sort of ribbon development of slightly incongruous um, buildings. It would have been a, quite a different scene. Not all the Trust's 230 houses are grand ones. Beatrix Potter's house in the Lake District, one of the first they acquired, is preserved exactly as it appeared in her delicate illustrations. Beatrix Potter is perhaps one of the more surprising of the many people from all walks of life who have helped the National Trust in its 100-year history. Four full-time staff tactfully control the endless stream of tourists. Sometimes they get two or three hundred Japanese tourists in Hilltop Farm in a day. We get anything up to about 80,000 visitors uh, in the summer when we're open to the public. Um, a few years ago we got up to very nearly 100,000, at which point we had to close the, uh, the house for an extra day a week. The number of visitors who come to Hilltop is in fact our, our major problem. We do manage to uh, exercise a little bit of control with the, the visitor flow through the house here, and we are pioneering a study which hopefully will start next year, when we will um, actually measure the wear and tear on a property. That's a piece of furniture over there, and here it is in the story. Everybody who works at Hilltop tends to be picked because they can get on well with people. Um, this isn't a house that's conducted in silence, it's a house with a, a nice happy atmosphere, a lot of children about. The Hilltop shop uses the proceeds from selling Beatrix Potter toys and chinaware to help maintain the house. National Trust policy is to make as many as possible of its properties self-supporting. Can you just excuse me while I go and fetch some more okay. Peter Rabbits, because we're a bit short. He's going up to the Warren. <laughs> the Beatrix Potter books are as popular today as they ever were. She just couldn't ever sit on her eggs for as long as 28 days. Do you remember? So she went away, didn't she? We've got that book. Yes. 
Have you? Have you? We've got all of the green books, actually. Which are the nicest? Timmy Willy. Oh, I like the egg one. We've studied old photographs of the garden here uh, and the pictures that Beatrix Potter drew in her books uh, and we've managed to keep the garden as it was in those days uh, even down to the fact that our gardener is instructed to leave it rather unkempt as you see it now. He has a list of approved weeds. This is actually a deliberate policy uh, to keep it looking as it did in say for example the uh, tale of Tom Kitten. It is easy to forget that the National Trust is a charity and depends entirely on people's generosity, people like Beatrix Potter. From the proceeds of her books, gradually over the years she bought 16 farms which she gave to the National Trust so that they and their way of life would be preserved. To begin with, they supported themselves, but that has all changed. You've got to make your profit somewhere else. You don't make any out of wool. Once in a time, wool was, would pay your rent, but it won't now. Well, uh, that face of wool, it's, I couldn't buy an ice cream with it. An ice cream would be 50 pence, and that face is worth 30 pence. So the tenant farmers have to rely on EC subsidies and a lot of help from the National Trust. Farming is in the doldrums these days. There are now far fewer farmers than there were even two, three generations ago. So the task is immense. And the trust, I think, is going to need all the help it can get, both from its own members who donate generously to things like the Lake District Appeal and from other agencies who support work in the countryside. If this sort of ideal of a sustainable agricultural economy which keeps the landscape going is to be achieved. The Trust is conducting an extensive survey of all the farm buildings, the fields and the walls to help them decide which of the landscape's historic features should be preserved. Does it matter, for example, if the stone walls crumble, the hedges disintegrate, the buildings fall down and the meadows become a sort of uniform green? Does that sort of detail matter or should we just be looking at the sort of wider sweeps of the view? What I think the debate is leading to is that the best way to keep going this pattern of small-scale farming which has created the landscape in the first place is to try and develop a system which works with the landscape rather than against it. The Trust recognises that nowadays its work in the Lake District depends heavily upon tourism. From all over Britain, people come to walk. they come in their thousands. so invigorated in the views of us, it's fantastic. Well, no, it's doing really you good because all the lovely fresh air. To cook your pot noodles on the, uh, <laughs> the old <Yeah>. stove. <laughs> as long as you pace yourself, it doesn't matter how old you are. Bit of a struggle, because we're all getting towards 40. <laughs> the tourists are both a blessing and a problem. This is the man who is responsible for trying to cope with the wear and tear caused by this vast army, all coming to admire the beauty of the Lake District. These stones are part of the very ancient pass of the Ste, as it used to be called. And we feel that they are probably early medieval, may even be older. We know that in the 13th century this was already a well-used truck. And it is this truck that we found in 1979, hidden under the bracken, hidden under the grass, and found it simply by trying to find a solution to our 20th century erosion problems, and wondering if I could bring a zigzag path across here. 
that I saw I was standing on a shiny boulder. When I got down on my hands and knees to investigate why, this is what I found. It was under the turf, under the bracken. And this has now given us the clue, has given us the, the lead for all of the footpath work that we do wherever we have rock mountains. We've had to go back to the ancients to learn how to do aesthetically the work of erosion control in the, in the late 20th century. Dealing with erosion and making footpaths costs money. One way the Trust economises is by using volunteers' labour, like mine on this occasion, and giving them some fun at the same time. As many as 23,000 people a year give their time to help the Trust. There are nearly 4,000 of these acorn projects for young people. Volunteers, as well as abseiling and mountaineering, make themselves useful by laying footpaths and rebuilding ancient stone walls. It's amazing to think that these were actually built by farmers dead generations ago. But then, uh, until fairly recently, I suppose their, their descendants would have been working locally, working possibly in the same farms. They must have been very, very tough, those medieval farmers. Dead easy. The next job was cutting down the rhododendron bushes, which smother everything that tries to grow under them. Partly because the toxins in the leaves, rhododendrons, as beautiful as they are in bloom, are quite toxic and ruin the soil around it. Other wildlife, you know, other vegetation is dying. Insect life begins to dwindle, and bird life dwindles. That's a vicious chain reaction. These are pretty vicious as well, Here we go. We have a, a tremendous problem with the rhododendron, which really is upsetting the balance of nature, the countryside around here. So we spend a lot of uh, time uh, on that, but also uh, never-ending tasks like caring for the footpaths, uh, erosion control on the sand dunes on the coast near here. But why give up your holiday to do hard labour in the pouring rain? It seemed like an you know, ideal opportunity to do something useful. Um, working in the big city, they'd often get the opportunity to, to help out in the countryside. That's what I enjoy most of all. Um, be around here in Snowdonia, which is one of the best places in the country to be, and the chance to do some constructive work as well. I want to do something really different that I'd never want, had done before, and I just wanted to feel that I was doing something good. Much to its surprise, the National Trust finds itself running several beaches around Britain. This is Studland Beach in Dorset. We get uh, lost children, quite a few lost children in the summer, which we have to go and find. And as you can see, litter, plenty of it. It's a job that has to be done. Somebody's got to do it. So, you know, it's just rubbish to me. Three, four-year-old girl locked herself in the toilet, so I had to go in and reach over the top with a brush and undo the lock to let her out. People injured themselves, cut themselves, then we had to do a bit of first aid and bandages, plasters, whatever, you know, to keep them happy. <laughs> Cafe is also owned by the Trust. It is another way of trying to meet the cost of general upkeep. I think people's image of a National Trust catering establishment is the, the little tea rooms on the side of a stately home run by um, volunteers. So they're very surprised when they see us down here with 300 yard queues and uh, ice cream and beef burgers. This entire headland was a bequest to the Trust and has enabled them to protect it from the sort of development that has happened on the other side of the bay. In all, the Trust protects 532 miles of coast, 
including the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland and a bird sanctuary in the Farne Islands. I believe that its greatest achievement is the protection of our coastline. Personally, I mean, that's a personal view. Um, and I say that because if you go abroad and you see what has happened to the coastline of southern Spain, of uh, lots of Italy, of Sicily, now happening to Turkey and so on, and come back here and you find that more than half the British coastline is still protected as a natural uh, and wonderful feature of these islands. That is because of the National Trust, because of Enterprise Neptune, which was founded 25 years ago. This is Corfe Castle in Dorset, in the top ten of the Trust's most visited properties. Even Gramps wouldn't be very clever to make a great big thing like this, because it must have taken a lot of years, don't you reckon? How do you reckon they got it right up the top there? Do you think yeah. it had a great big crane? The ruins of 12th century Corfe Castle attracted 163,000 people last year. And at least half of them seemed to be very keen to know what Jeff Phillips, the stonemason, was doing. He's mounting this castle up again, isn't he? Mm. Not all the castle. Is he? No. Oh. I don't think he's going to have enough stone, is he, to do all of it? <laughs> he could try, though. Even though Corfe is a ruin, it's still got a lot of architectural features that you can go round and read. This particular section, although to some people it's just a ruined section of the castle, it's got quite a few features in it. And our job is to pick out these features by not overdoing it. I mean, our job is not to rebuild. But perhaps the Trust's most significant achievement is the preservation of some of the most beautiful of Britain's country houses and making them accessible to all visitors. When one thinks of the number of great English houses that have been destroyed, pulled down, uh, running into many hundreds, I think one has to be thankful that the National Trust did take on what are now 200 or so open to the public. Uh, what would have happened to these? They either would have gone completely um, or they would have been turned into hotels or leisure centers or something. Uh, so I, I do think that is a great, great achievement. Fenton House um, is unusual amongst National Trust houses because it's in London um, and much loved uh, because it's a, like a doll's house. But the wonderful thing about this house and the things that make, thing that makes it different from any other house we own or any house open to the public that I know is the fact that when you come here you hear the sound of early stringed instruments playing. Major Benton Fletcher, great benefactor of ours who died before the war, left us his collection of early stringed instruments and he was one of the first people to be interested in, in, in the instruments on which the music we now enjoy so much was pl originally played. And um, uh, the, they were put away in the country during the war, they survived the war, and they were brought here to supplement the, the visual pleasures of this house. So you have this rare experience of hearing instruments being played, because anyone who's a good player can uh, play the instruments if they ask to do so. We try and give the public as much pleasure as possible, at the same time ensuring that the things they've come to see will survive for their children and their grandchildren to see. I mean, that's our fundamental job. As soon as the house closes for the winter, and after a couple of weeks, every piece of furniture has a white cotton cover, all made by volunteers for us. Thousands and thousands of volunteer hours have gone into stitching these things based on 18th century originals, because it was old practice. A hat is slid over each, and you see these strange <laughs> abstract objects done up in tissue paper, looking like a series of little rather untidily done up presents. Uh, 
and the house quietly goes to sleep and remains uh, in that way until spring comes and it comes to life again. Contrary to what most people think, not all our houses are grand mansions built for, for members of the aristocracy. Uh, two or three years ago, we had the extraordinary good fortune to be left a house which is as precious in its way as any great country house, which is number five, Blythe Grove in Worksop. Um, and this is remarkable because um, it had been it was built in about 1903. Soon afterwards, it was bought by a family called Straw. Uh, who were prosperous seed merchants. And the two sons, who never married, uh, continued to keep the house exactly as it had been when they knew it in their childhood. And they lived on to into their 90s. I remember particularly the extraordinary feeling of walking into that front room with the clock ticking and uh, complete silence. It was particularly important to make sure that we had listed and catalogued every single object, however humble, because of course there was no one thing of any great value here. It was the accumulation and the fact that they'd been together for a long time. Every drawer was full and the, just the sheer sort of quantity of objects and contents was sort of almost overpowering. In most of the bedrooms, you open the drawers and they are full of clothes and personal belongings, diaries, letters, newspapers, yes. all sorts of sort of aspects of everyday life which have just been sort of carefully pushed away and, and the drawer shut and left. And you felt as you went along, you were learning more and more and more about it with every drawer you opened. Little David's hair. Oh, that's the little boy that died, isn't it? Their youngest son. This is Kingston Lacey Estate in Dorset, and it houses one of the most valuable and beautiful private art collections in Britain. Nearly half a million school children visit trust properties every year and do work directly related to the national curriculum. Is the dining room. They very often went to as much as 15 different courses. You see the sh chandelier, I wouldn't have thought they would have really used lights in there. It would be candles. And oh, candles, yes, was, yes is definitely. Is it like yeah. glass or real crystal? That is cut glass. cut glass. Now, when you go into the saloon, you'll find one that's, that's a crystal chandelier. This bed was found all in pieces, wrapped up in newspaper, in one of the attics. And the National Trust took it all, brought it down, cleaned it, and reassembled it, and made new furnishings. These days, visitors are as interested in what happens below stairs as above stairs. To get the water out of the sheets and all the other clothes, they used this. Who knows what it was called? Yes? A mangle. A mangle. Who'd like to have a turn? Come on, then. By the way, that's it. And that was how they got the water out. They didn't have spin dryers. Who knows what these are? They're little boys' coats. <laughs> now, you didn't wear a coat like that when you were a little boy, did you? No. So would you have liked to have worked in this laundry? No. no. In, the, in this ironing room, think how hot it would be in the summer. It would have been quite horrible because they had um, to always do as a toll and they had servants <laughs> and things like that. It's not very nice. But what's not very nice? I thought it's very nice to have servants. Well, it's not because they, they keep him up for all five o'clock in the morning and they stay up until t 12 o'clock in the night and um, well, quite often and they have to work a lot and they're, all, and they're not given f food a lot, I wouldn't have thought. 
like the man of the house, the person who owns it, he would like he would like it because he has, doesn't have to do anything at all. All he has to do is sit down and just eat. And there's all the things about him, press a bell. Oh, like he needs the butler, ding, ding. <laughs> It's part of the curriculum of the schools that they should come to Kingston Lacey and um, do a project there which is linked to the history of the house. I believe that the educational aspects and, and uh, activity of the Trust is likely to be one of the biggest things in the future. For all kinds of reasons, the Trust has got to make itself accessible to the next generation in the schools and to tell them what it is, what opportunities there are for them. In the loads, in the riverways, you might see some fish in there. Wick and Fen was the first and possibly the greatest nature reserve to come to the Trust in 1926. And it's a very rare survival of the old Fenland, the undrained Fenland of East Anglia. Now then. Did I say the fens were made with water, underwater? Yeah. Yeah. Right, now remember your smell yeah. memories. You've had three other samples. We have developed there a, an educational program which actually shows the children what is important about a nature reserve and what lives there. Right, so you've got to check for things like worms. Make sure there are no living things in there because they don't like soil testing. Are you listening? Hello in the back row. Are you listening? Right. Take your sample and squeeze it. Does any water come out? Yes. yes. They do tend to be a little bit frisky. You know, they're out of the classroom and they think it's absolutely wonderful and keeping order is quite a problem. So we try and keep the group sizes small and keep the activities exciting and keep them rolling through the day. Right, well, different soils react differently to movements and you can actually test for that. You can always rely on the girls. Right. Jump, come on! Come on! Come on! Jump, 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 jump. Right, OK, off. Now, I could just oh. about feel that, but it was nowhere near shaking like a jelly. Keep going, Mary. Yep, right. Jump, 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 jump! Oh. jump. The voice fell still. Right. right. Now, what do you think that was in the score of 1 to 10? Right. Now that's because under our feet there's nothing solid down there. Look, it's a spider. Yeah. I've got one. I've got a little one. Oh wow, yes you have. I've got two bugs. Oh, yeah. You've got it, you've got it. Sylvia, I've got enough now, Sylv. Have you? Yeah. And I'm not Sylv, thank you. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> Suck. Right. We better start recording. I think so. Oh. The main purpose of the education programme at Wickham Fen is to teach children about the environment in the environment. They absolutely love it. And in fact, it's their energy that devises the programmes that we do because the kids come and say, oh, wow, they think that's absolutely super. So we devise education programmes around the wow. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You can't just let nature look after itself. Wickham Fen is a very highly managed site. Uh, we're, we're working on it all the time. What we're trying to do with the, um, the activities that the children to do, do is to see small aspects of the management of the Fen. Right, there's one more sample to take. I love it. I love every minute of it. Um, yes, it drives me balmy. But I love every minute of my job here. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Church Castle is one of the surviving, really great medieval border castles that defended the border between the marches between England and Wales. And it looks like it with chunky towers with battlements on them, echoed in the garden. It's going to be the scene of a visit by the Young National Trust Theatre Company. And what they do is to create um, a historical event that could have happened in that setting. And in this case, it, it's um, a, a story about the Cavaliers and the Roundheads in the, the time of Cromwell. 
Uh, and the important thing about it is that it, it's a performance for school well? parties. And, where is your daughter? and the children become very much involved in the performance. Oh, helping with your gown, Mrs. Oh, if you will bring it forward. My, how she has grown. How old is she now? Twelve. My husband has been dead five years now. And I still mourn for him. Robinson, you are accustomed to such tasks. Are you married? Um, no, not at the moment. Well, how come is it that you have <laughs> learnt how to tie our lady's corset? Well, <laughs> no, I shall not ask you, sir. Not in front of your friends. No. Basically, this no, is the story of this lady, Lady Vaughan, who is the, the lady of the house. Right, her secret is that her son and the only living heir to the estate has died. And she's just been ill herself. She's had the pox. That's why I wear this little masky bit to cover my face. And, um... The news comes that today my cousin, who is a member from, for Parliament, is going to visit with a bunch of his Republican friends. And that is really disturbing <coughs> to me because I'm thinking, oh no, if my cousin finds out my son's dead, he's going to take this house away from me. So I set up this big masquerade to um, disguise somebody as my son so that my cousin won't guess he's dead. I must call you William now and you must think of yourself as nothing else. You are 12 years old. Your birthday is in February. Jacket, I thank you, sir. You were ill for a month. Now listen, boy. The doctor did come, and he did bleed you. Do you know what this means? No. Well, he did place upon your skin an animal like that of the slug. He did place it here, here, and here. And this animal, called the leech, did suck the blood from your veins, and it did make you well again. God be thanked for your recovery. William, what was the nature of this sickness? Smallpox, sir. The pox? Uh -huh. The physician, did he bleed you? Yes, he did, sir. Uh, oh, with leeches or by the knife? With leeches, sir. Know you in which room I am to stay for my visit here? Um, in the guest room, sir. It depends on how much um, preparation the children have done before and uh, also how willing they are to, to take on a role and take part. And sometimes they're really willing and sometimes not at all, but it's part of our job to kind of draw them out and hopefully make them feel comfortable about taking part. Because most of the time they want to, but they just feel a bit embarrassed and they feel quite intimidated by the house. I thought they so were great. I really did. Yeah, yeah they, they were wonderful. today, especially yeah. William. William. Best William we've ever had, yeah. Was good. For the purpose of good debate, you must all meet with each other and let monarchist talk to republic. Republican, Republican, talk to Radical, and Radical, talk to Monarchist. Why, why do you think that there should be no king and no government? Why do you think there should, should be? Should we make your own choices? There should be a king, king and no government. Where will you get in life with your own choices? You always need someone up there, yeah. superior. A king. Someone to look up to, someone that's always one above you. A king will always be there. Why oh, have one when you can have both? And make everybody happy. A bit of two sides would be a lot better yes, than just one Yes, make a compromise. Me to king. the middle. King. 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 Need a king. 16, sir. And I declare the radicals have it. Because we're learning about it in history, it's helped a lot. I mean, I, I understand what went on then a lot better now than I did before at school. I found it really good how you're not just sitting at a desk and it all drummed into your head. You like acting it out and... Uh, when I came here, I wasn't really understanding it that much. But now I know what it is, what happened, how everyone sort of, everyone's point of view was. And then when we marched up and down, we, we were there, we weren't just watching, we were actually in it ourselves. It was really good. Now, everyone thinks about our country houses, but the most popular things we own, by a, by a long chalk, are our gardens. Whenever we do a survey of members' uh, views about the National Trust, they always say that the gardens are the things they love most. There are the famous landscape gardens, um, man-made pieces of classical landscape for which England is so famous, and Starhead is the most famous of those. It's not what most people think of as a garden. It's, there are no flowers in it, really. There are shrubs, but it's mostly water and temples and follies and bridges and trees. If you want to study the picturesque movement, you go to Scotland. As you walk down from the toad through the garden, you get a series of picturesque views, all very carefully composed.
Nobody had ever heard of Bidalf Grange Garden in Staffordshire. It's a garden designed in the 1860s by a man called James Bateman, who was, like a lot of English people, a great traveller and very interested in plants. And his uh, conceit was that this garden should recreate the habitats from which all the plants came from all over the world. And so in an extraordinary way, you walk the cleft in the rocks and suddenly you come into China with a red and white uh, and blue temple with golden bells on it glimmering across a lake. And a great bull with a golden sun in his horns glaring down at you. It's the most marvellous place. If I were going to recommend anyone to visit an autumn garden in England, I would go to Sheffield Park. The Nissas, I think, is the tree that colours so beautifully, makes a, a, a great display of flame which puts New England to shame. You don't have to know about flowers to enjoy sitting on a gar in a garden. So whoever you are, you can get pleasure from a place like Fenton Heights. It's loved by the people of Hampstead as a, as a, as a green oasis on the top of a hill with wonderful air like today in the middle of a densely populated part of the world. I've a shelter for the hens and a stable for the ass. And sure, what could a man want more? The gardener, who you're going to meet, I think, I um, is a very keen vegetable grower, John. And um, what you see down there at the end of the orchard is his own private garden. Of course, he's very happy for people to see it and will tell you all about what's growing. And I'm living all alone, and there's no one looking after me. I remember one day there was a crowd of uh, schoolboys came in and most of them were up in the top garden, but two of the more adventurous chaps came down into the uh, kitchen garden, and it was uh, autumn time, and the apples were ripening, and the tomatoes were reddening, and uh, the spuds were being dug up, and the two little boys they looked round in amazement, and the onions were swelling on top of the ground, one says to the other. It's just like a supermarket here, isn't it? <laughs> and they shouted for the rest of the boys, come down quick, it's like a supermarket here. <laughs> and I mean to go and ask her whenever I get bold if she'll come and have an eye to me. I don't know. The National Trust now owns and preserves an example of almost every period and style of gardening. Um, and uh, some of them are famous throughout the world. People will come over and over again to a garden because it's a dynamic, changing thing. Americans find it hard to believe that this house was actually here 150 years or so before America was discovered. What I'm trying to do is get as close as possible to perhaps a medieval monastery garden as befits the house. This is most useful for taking away the smells of everyday life. Can you imagine? No plumbing, animals living in the same house as you, actually in the same room as you, smoke from the fire all over the room and then gradually dissipating further and further into the roof and out of the roof. And possibly the birds nesting in the roof as well, dropping what they do best on the floor. When I first came, the, these beds were actually full up with hybrid tea roses, and the first job to do was take all the soil out, all the roses out, and replace them with good, old-fashioned, lovely, scented roses. Parsley, the Romans brought over. Figs came with the Romans. Thyme grows naturally on the downs. This is borage. They taste of cucumber. And a nifty little trick is to put one in an ice cube and let it dissolve nicely into your pims. These are bear's bridges, and they were the inspiration for the Greek and art architects and the Corinthians as the acanthus leaf motif on all their columns and over the top of arches and things like that. This is great mullein, Aaron's rod. They virtually resemble the shape of a foot, so they used to put them in the sandals to cure all sorts of foot problems, bunions, 
odour eaters, and also the equivalent of Nike's soft pads on those hard Roman roads. You must One really of my... love your job, you know. Yeah, it is, it's great. I mean, it is, it's just, I mean, you can't call it a job. I mean, honestly, you'd say, you know, I'll do that for nothing. Maintaining this huge variety of properties, which include mills, pubs, post offices, a gold mine and an island, needs nearly 3,000 paid employees. Where do they all come from? I worked eight years for the Inland Revenue as a tax collector. I was a saddler, making bridles and things for racehorses and what have you. I was a designer and I was made redundant from my design job. I was in the, in the city. I was ten years a merchant banker. I started life as an insurance broker in the city where I went because my father sent me there. And uh, then I escaped from that, some difficulty, and uh, went to work for an antique dealer in London. Well, I was a bank manager. I've done farm work, um, gardening. I also worked at the oil wells down at Witch. It's all I've ever done, really, this, this job. Claremont Gardens in Surrey. <laughs> Every night, for five nights, 5,000 gods and goddesses from the home counties come to revel in the garden of the gods. It's important to remember that the founders created the National Trust for the enjoyment of, of the whole nation, of people. Uh, and we mustn't ever forget that. We, we don't preserve these places in aspic. Uh, the whole point is that people should come and enjoy them. And one of the great challenges for the National Trust is to find that balance between preservation on the one hand and access and enjoyment and recreation on the other. This is one of several hugely popular fêtes champêtres the National Trust hold during the summer in properties all over the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether I'm tutting or cohen. <laughs> this is my mummy. We're gonna be we're gonna be put in a sarcophagus together, you see. He's a load of bull. When the trust took over these gardens, the whole place was covered in scrub, and Capability Brown's amphitheatre had to be rediscovered. We started off having the fete just every two years, and it was just a historical thing. Um, and then the themes got more and more inventive, until now, as you see us tonight, we're here with the Garden of the Gods. It's become really very adventurous. These occasions use local amateur talent, which proves remarkably versatile. <laughs> Originally, centuries ago, it was designed as a pleasure garden and what we hope we're recreating with the fate, certainly in a rather different style from a few centuries ago, but we hope we're going to get back somehow to the idea of a pleasure garden where people just simply come to have fun and to enjoy what the National Trust is doing. The wonderful thing actually about the Claremont fate is that when everybody's hiding behind their fancy dress costumes, you really don't know who you've got here. I'm Neptune. <laughs> Who am I? Medusa! My little petal. <laughs> it's wonderful walking around the lake and everyone you come across has a smile on their face because they're all dressed up and looking yes. totally loopy. The most celebrated role, obviously, is in preserving properties and countryside for the enjoyment of the entire nation. But I also hope that with something like this event, we're also going to be making people realise that there's a lot of fun to be had out of the National Trust as well. Who came 
last year and they told us about it, but we had no idea it was going to be as fantastic as this. It was absolutely superb, superb. Uh, it's just fantastic. It's magical. I wish, I wish it wasn't stopping. <laughs> We bring a group of friends, and we it bring is the bubbly, fantastic. we all do a little the food, course. We do a course it's each. Just... There's 12 of us. We come every year and it's brilliant. And, and this isn't rain. my wife either. And this isn't my you husband. Who she is? So who cares? We don't care. Bye. We met this evening. I do feel proud of it because I think it is a marvellous organisation um, doing a really tremendous job and, and it's a great privilege to run it. It's my life and uh, I can't think of anything I'd have preferred to do than look after a piece of uh, my country. to use, but the National Trust is unique. No other country has an organization like it. There are over two million members, but in truth, it belongs to everyone.